Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to introduce this session on antiretroviral strategies. Um, let me first present uh, my session co-chair, Omar Swed from the Westpet Foundation in Argentina. Each presenter will do a 10-minute presentation followed by a five-minute question slot. And I would like to hand over now to Omar for uh, welcoming the first speaker. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with Alexandra. Uh, the first presentation is uh, comparative effectiveness of first-line antiretroviral therapy regimens results from a large real-world cohort in Brazil after the implementation of dolutegravir. This is presented by Mariana Veloso, who holds a master's degree in epidemiology of infectious diseases. Mariana is a civil servant of the Ministry of Health of Brazil. She has been working at the monitoring and evaluation branch of the Department of STIs, AIDS, and Viral Hepatitis since 2013. Mariana, the floor is yours. So thank you, uh, the DIS, for the invitation. And um, I'd like to start by acknowledging and thanking all the people living with HIV who have contributed with data for the study. And I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So a uh, little bit on the scenario of the HIV epidemic in Brazil. So in 2017, we had around 867,000 people living with HIV, of whom 65% were males and around 548,000 were on ART, corresponding to 63% uh, of the total PLHIV. Um, it's important to know that ARVs are distributed in Brazil by the public health system free of charge since 1996. And uh, regarding our adult treatment guidelines, so in December 2013, Brazil implemented a, the, the treatment for all strategy meaning the recommendation to initiate ART in all people living with HIV, regardless of CD4 count or clinical stage. And the first line, uh, the preferred first line treatment recommended then for adults was lamivudine tenofovir efebrine, still at TLE. And in early 2017, these guidelines were uh, changed and dolutegravir replaced efebrine in the first line treatment. So the objective of our study was to compare the observed effective effectiveness of different regimens in the initial response to ART in adults in Brazil from 2014 to 2017 using real-world programmatic data from the Brazilian Ministry of Health. So uh, on the databases that were used for the study, firstly the ARV dispensation system. So in Brazil there are no private uh, there are no ARV sales in private establishments, so this system captures virtually everyone on ART in the country. The database registers the, the regimens dispensed with their durations, with, which can be from 30 to 180 days, but are most often for 30 days. The drugs and the formulations. Uh, the HIV lab, laboratory exam system, so it captures CD4 and viral load exams performed within the public laboratories, those which are paid by the public health system. So it does not capture information on people with private health care insurance, which um, is around 25% of the population. And these two systems, they share a common registration database with a single unique identifier, which gathers personal information on the patients. So our outcome was the six-month virological suppression, uh, measured by the viral load count around 180 days using a threshold of 50 copies. For our statistical analysis, we used univariable and multivariable logistic regression models. And our inclusion criteria was age 15 years or older, having started ART from January 2014 to June 2017, and having information on the six-month viral load count. And we excluded patients who had an undetectable baseline viral load count due to uncertainty as to whether they were indeed ART naive. So our independent variables, our main independent variable then was the ART regimen. Uh, so we listed uh, all regimens with at least 1% frequency, which were six regimens, and grouped the rest into others. And we controlled for sex, age, baseline, CD4 and viral load counts, and adherence, which was based on pharmacy refill data calculated as a percentage based on the 
dates and the durations of the dispensations uh, registered into the ARV system. So uh, 105,533 people living with HIV met the inclusion criteria. 2.2% were excluded because they had a, an undetectable baseline viral load, resulting in 103,240 individuals included in the analysis. So our overall six-month virological suppression was 76.9%. 67.6% .9%. uh, of our cohort were males. Median age was 34. Median CD4 was 394 cells. Median uh, logarithm of the viral load was 4.58 copies. And median adherence was 96.2%. Um, so the results now regarding the control variables, uh, adjusted odds ratios were higher for females, for older patients, for patients with higher CD4 counts and lower viral load counts, and with higher adherence. So um, now regarding the main, main stu study variable, uh, the RT regimen, so um, virological suppression ranged from 63.7 to 85.2%. And in the, in the adjusted analysis, we set uh, TLE as the reference, since it was the, the regimen recommended as, as preferred first line for most of the study period, and it contains 74% of our patients. So uh, TLD, which replaced TLE uh, in early 2017 uh, as first choice, presented 42% higher odds of virological suppression than our reference. The regimen with uh, zidovudine, lamivudine, zidovudine, and efavirenz uh, was similar to our reference. And regarding the PIs, uh, the regimen with boosted etazanavir was 33% inferior to our reference. And the regimens with lopinavir, boosted lopinavir were 41 and 46% inferior. 41% the one with zidovudine and 46% the one with tenofovir. So uh, now let's briefly go through some of the limitations of our study. Firstly, the adherence was measured from pharmacy refill data, so accuracy may have been less than ideal. But this method has been previously validated using the same ARV database, and adherence was highly predictive of virological suppression. And we did um, several analyses with both uh, continuous and different categorizations for adherence, and results were very similar. Also important variables were not available or not consistently reported, such as clinical stage, pregnancy, or co-infections. And uh, most importantly, indication bias was uh, likely present, since some regimens are recommended or counterindicated in specific situations, such as pregnancy, tuberculosis, co-infection, or, com or other com comorbidities. So for example, uh, lamivudine, zidovudine, and bucilopinavir was uh, recommended for pregnant women until 2014. But regarding um, our most important result, I'd say, so the comparison between the, the two first-line regimens, uh, we believe indication bias does not seem to have interfered. We had two reasons for concern. One was that in the current guidelines, the, the 2017 guidelines, TLE is still first choice for non-severe cases of TB co-infection. And in 2015 and 16, it was first choice for pregnant women. So what we did was we tested models excluding these patients, so female patients uh, in 2015 and 16, or all patients on, on TLE in 2017, and results were very, very similar. So to conclude, then, the observed effectiveness of TLD in our cohort was markedly superior to other regimens after controlling for age, sex, adherence, and baseline CD4 and viral load counts. It was 42% superior to TLE and 51 to 162% superior to other regimens. So our results then, we consider that they support the decision made by the Ministry of Health to switch its recommendations for preferred first-line ART from efavirenz to dolutegravir. Thank you. Okay, it's time for questions. Microphone number four. Introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, Bart Renders from Rotterdam. Um, you mentioned that you had a window of 90 days around the six month time frame. So that means that also patients where you have a viral load 
three months after the start were included. And if that's the case, then the, as you know, the time to suppression is faster with integrase, slower with PIs. The, res the results may be different if you have a longer follow-up. You agree? Or? Yes, I'm uh, not sure I heard the whole thing, but um, you, we, yeah, we use that, that time frame to, to be able to include more patients with the recommendation in Brazil is to, to assess uh, ART yeah, in viral edge expression around six months. So I don't have the exact numbers uh, by heart, but most of them are sometimes when they have uh, other co-infections that they're more severely affected. They do it earlier, but around two weeks to so one month. So you could just look at, that at, we didn't at the subgroup where you have six months or later. Sorry? Then, no, it's, a, it's okay. <laughs> Other short question. Did you look at resistance, baseline resistance, or it's not no, standard? No, no, no. no. no we don't do uh, pretreatment genotype in Brazil. Okay. No. That, that um, probably that. influenced the results as well. We, we have uh, estimated 11% uh, resistant to efferens. Santiago. Hi, Santiago from Mexico. Thank you so much. Amazing numbers. Um, two very quick questions. Do you have information on adverse events and how those impacted uh, your results? And the other is, do you have info on virological failures? Uh, did you do genotype testing after failure? And so. so what was the second, if we do? Virological failure, do you have information on, on those who failed? And the first, the adverse events. Yes, yeah. uh, so we do uh, genotyping after virological failure, but it's not registered into this same system, so we can't link the data yet. Uh, and adverse events, we don't have that either. We've, we had a, a, a pharmacosurveillance uh, system implemented for dolutegravir, but again, it's a separate system. But um, we're including in the study we, we wish to publish some analysis on losses to follow up and um, on treatment changes. So, um, and they were very low, like less than 1% uh, of patients on dolutegravir changed regimens in the first six months, and around 3% of them changed um, those were on a February. This is my question. Okay, perfect. This is a combined uh, TLD or. No, it's uh, combined uh, tenofovir and, and uh, lamivudine and dolutegravir separate, two pills, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce the second presentation on monotherapy of dolutegravir during the prim primary HIV infection. Uh, this presentation will be done by Dominique Brown. So Dominic Brown is a talented young MD working at the Division of Infectious Disease in Zurich in Switzerland. He is involved in the care of HIV-infected patients both as a clinician but also as a researcher. He is a principal investigator of several investigator, um, trials investigating the concept of ART simplification, but he is also involved in the issue of hepatitis C elimination strategy among HIV-positive men who have sex with men. So thank you, Dominique. So good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to present our work here. Here are my conflict of interest statements for the last two years. So monotherapy with dolutegravir is not generally recommended, and this is because in two randomized controlled trials, a substantial number of biological failures with emergence of resistance to integrase strand transfer inhibitors were reported. For non-RCTs and retrospective studies, the data are more controversial because some studies showed maintained viral suppression on dolutegravir immunotherapy and some studies did not. In contrast, there is convincing data for dual therapy in combination with rilpivirine or 3TC. The concept of dolutegravir monotherapy, or generally monotherapy, have never been tested in patients who started combination antiretroviral therapy CART during primary HIV infection, 
That means within six months after the estimated date of infection. So our study hypothesis was that patients who started CART during primary HIV infection are maybe the optimal candidates for successful ART simplification. And this is because in contrast to chronically infected patients who started their CART during the chronic phase of infection, these patients harbor a smaller HIV reservoir, have less immune activation, and a smaller viral diversity. And we wanted to, to see if these properties translate in maintaining viral suppression of the simplification to dolitegravir monotherapy. So the first objective was to determine the efficacy of a simplified dolitegravir monotherapy compared to CART at week 48. And the second objective was to quantify the HIV-1 latent reservoir at baseline and at week 48, and to assess the HIV RNA load in the spherospinal fluid at baseline and at week 48. The inclusion criteria were patients aged older than 18 years with a documented primary HIV infection. And they had to initiate the CART within 180 days after their estimated date of infection. They were not allowed to have previous structure treatment interruption, no previous virological failures, and they had to be suppressed with a viral load defined as 50 copies and below for at least 48 weeks before simplification. The exclusion criteria were presence of one or more major resistance associated mutations to INSTIS, a history of virological failure, active hepatitis B infection, and women who were pregnant or breastfeeding or intended to become pregnant during the course of the study or had a lack of safe contraception. This was a non-inferiority trial, so our null hypothesis was that dolitegravir monotherapy is inferior by at least a non-inferiority margin of 10% compared to CART. The study procedures included a lumbar puncture to assess the HIV RNA in the CSF at baseline and at week 48, the HIV DNA measurements in PBMCs at baseline and at week 48, and the measurement of high fire drug levels in plasma and CSF at baseline and at week 48, and the primary endpoint was virological response defined as proportion of patients without virological failure at week 48 or before. And you can see that in the dolitegravir monotherapy group, we did very frequent measurement of the HIV RNA during the first six months, but the patient only had to come for the blood treatment and they did not have to see the doctors due to time reasons. Overall, we randomized 101 patients in a 2 to 1 ratio to dolitegravir monotherapy or to continuation of CART. In the per protocol analysis, we excluded one patient in the monotherapy arm because he fulfilled the criteria of a major protocol violation and one patient was included in the CART group because he moved abroad before reaching week 48. Here are the baseline characteristics and they were balanced between both groups. Please note that the days from infection until start of first CART was pretty short in both groups of 35 and 36 days, respectively. And the median time on CART before study entry was similar in both groups. And this is the most important slide of my presentation because it shows the primary endpoint efficacy analysis at week 48. In yellow, the dolitegravir monotherapy group, and in blue, the CART group. As you can see here, we had a 100% biological response rate in the per protocol analysis in both the dolitegravir monotherapy group and the CART group, reaching non-inferiority and the pre-specified levels. In the intention to treat, we had a 67 out of 68 virological response rate in the dolitegravir monotherapy group, and this was because this one patient um, had a major protocol violation. 
And in the card group, there were 100% biological response rate. Please note that the patient who moved abroad in the card group was counted as success in the ITT analysis because we assumed that this patient would maintain viral suppression either, even after leaving the study, and we wanted to be as conservative as possible. The patient who fulfilled the criteria of a major protocol violation had a biological failure on doltegravir monotherapy at week 36 with a viral load of 386 copies per ml, which was confirmed four weeks later. This patient was clearly misclassified, having had a primary HIV infection at the time when he was starting his first CART in 2004, and therefore was excluded in the per-protocol analysis. We assessed the HIV RNA in the CSF at the time of virological failure at week 36 and could not detect HIV RNA. There was no emergence of resistance-associated mutations to INSTIS in this patient, and he was heat suppressed on his CART, which he had before simplification. Here you can see the HIV DNA measurements from baseline to week 48, and as you can see, there was a comparable slight decay of total HIV DNA in both groups. Please note that the patient with the biological failure was classified on the third quartile um, of the overall HIV DNA loads of all patients. We assessed HIV RNA in the CSF at week zero and at week 48, and as you can see, we could not detect any positive RNA measurements in any of the patients. Overall, there were eight serious adverse events, none of them related to study drugs. There was no treatment discontinuations due to side effects or no RT switch due to adverse events in the Dolitegria Monocera group. And the most frequent possible and probable drug-related adverse events included elevated liver enzyme levels, elevated creatinine levels, nausea and fatigue, but there was no significant difference between both groups. So, to conclude, the Dolterogria monotherapy was non-inferior compared to CART in patients which started their first CART within 180 days after their estimated day of infection and had a suppressed viremia for at least 48 weeks. There was a comparable slight decay of HIV-1 reservoir in both groups, and we um, had a suppressed HIV RNA in the CSF among all patients who underwent a lumbar puncture. We conclude from our study that future simplification studies should use a stratification according to the time of HIV infection until start of first card in the light of precision medicine. And with that, I want to thank to all patients of the Zurich Primary HIV Infection Study and the Swiss HIV Court Study, and to all collaborators of the study and also to the University of Zurich's Clinical Research Priority Program for funding the study and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique. So, uh, microphone one. Uh, Jose Arribas from Madrid, Spain. Thank you for your interesting data. But in your trial, you have two interventions. You have uh, monotherapy with dolutegravir and intensive follow-up in the uh, dolutegravir monotherapy arm. You follow the patients every month for, uh, uh, and that's different from the triple therapy arm. So what impact in the results you think it had, the fact that you uh, follow the patients so closely in monotherapy? So the reason why we did that was, of course, to detect the viral failure very early on, because we know that we can then emerge, uh, can prevent the emergence of resistance um, if we then react. And um, yes, we did so. So the probability to detect a voucher failure was higher in the monocyte group compared to the CART group. But at the end, because we did not have any failure, it makes no difference. Right, but, but just to point out that there are two interventions. Yeah, your, your results should be applicable to um, monotherapy with velotegravir plus intensive follow-up that might have an impact on adherence and other issues. 
Yeah, I mean, the adherence could maybe be higher in the monotherapy group. It was followed very closely, but overall spoken, the adherence is very high in our patient group, and this is also shown in other data coming from the Swiss HIV cohort study and from the Zurich primary HIV infection study. Thank you. Microphone two. Okay, so, so I take it these patients are still on therapy, on monotherapy. Are, are, are these people still taking monotherapy? Yes, yes, okay. so, yes. So while the question was, was, was controversial in 2015 when your study started and you didn't include a timeline, it's clearly continued when, there's, when you put a, a, study on, uh, a slide on saying that monotherapy shouldn't be recommended by anybody. And, and I'm concerned that, that the unpredictability of response when it does come it with, with dollar therapy monotherapy means that at some point you've just been lucky that in this small study someone hasn't rebounded and got, got cross-class -class resistance. And so I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable that this study continues irrespective of your results. Non-inferiority is not good enough. And, and the, the, at least adding 3TC to these patients I think should be recommended. I also have a problem with your hypothesis that an, a smaller reservoir should make any difference to the effectiveness of dolitegravir monotherapy because the, although median reservoir size is, is smaller in early infection, the range between individual patients means that some people in primary infection have a much higher reservoir than other people have in chronic infection. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm unhappy with this study. Yeah. So I mean to comment um on your first comment. So we had enough power to show the non-inferiority um, with our sample size, and we will prolong the study to four years to have a long follow-up. Um, and um, for your second comment, it was related to? Reservoir. Oh, the reservoir I, I, size. Yeah, I mean, it was one of our hypotheses besides having a smaller viral diversity and less immune activation. So probably, if you have all these properties together, this might then translate into this maintenance of our suppression. So I'm surprised that you get ethical authority to continue this study. Microphone four. Yeah, I, I can just add that in the, the Dutch monotherapy study, we looked at viral reservoir as a predictor of failure, and there was also a statistically significant relation between a higher reservoir and a higher chance of virological failures. So maybe there is something there. So thank you for the comment. I mean, also in our um, chronically infected patient who failed on the monotherapy, as you have seen, he had a very high um, HV1 viral reservoir. So this also confirms our hypothesis, I would say. Thank you, Dominique. Do you have any data on immune activation in this study? Not less. We aim to um, investigate have. that, yet. Okay. Yeah, but I, I think the point of the reservoir, if it's related to this is because it's primary infected patient or is the reservoir level the, the variable that influence the success, it is important because it could inform further studies for chronically infected patients with low reservoir or yep. reject patient yep. or protect yep. patient in primary infection with high reservoir, as we yep. mentioned. It. And, and I'm, I'm happy to see that the follow-up was more intensive to avoid, but also uh, to reinforce the need of a good communication with the ethical committee and uh, with the community advisory board in order to be sure that not putting risk uh, of the patient. Thank you very yeah, much. I totally agree. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll now move to the outcome of dolumonotherapy in chronically infected patients with a suppressed viral load, and this is the Monke study. The Monke study will be presented by Laurent Oclou. Uh, he got his medical diploma in Paris and graduated as a practitioner in internal medicine and infectiology in Paris. He's now working as a physician in the infectious disease department of Orléans La Source Regional Hospital in France. He's been involved in HIV AIDS patient care for more than 15 years. His work focuses on the advantages of an early antiretroviral therapy on both qualitative and quantitative aspects of viral reservoirs and immune restorations. 
Um, Dr. Hochlu's team was the first to describe a group of HIV post-treatment controllers known as the Visconti study, the very famous Visconti study. So thank you, uh, Laurent, and please present us the Monke study. Thank you for this kind introduction. Just a quick introduction. We, as many others now, uh, we believe that uh, less drug regimens may be helpful for aging patients living with HIV to endure a lifelong antiretroviral therapy, in particular with those who have comorbidities and comedications. What we know about less drug regimens, some dual therapies have proven to be non-inferior to triple and are now approved worldwide. Whereas boosted PI monotherapies always fail to prove non-inferiority over a long time. So a couple of years ago, uh, dolutegravir looked like an ideal drug for maintenance monotherapy because of its potency, its high genetic barrier, its overall good tolerance and convenience, and few drug-drug interactions. So we planned this study in 2015. Monkey is an open-labeled randomized controlled trial that we conducted in nine reference centers in France. It addressed to people with stable, efficient, and well-tolerated dolutegravir bacavir 3 tc regimen uh, that had uh, viral, plasma viral load less than 50 copies for at least 12 months, no AIDS events, a nadir CD4 above 100 cells per cubic millimeter, and of course, no mutation or failure any, uh, under uh, any uh, INSTI-based regimen. At the screening, uh, patients should have a plasma viral load less uh, than the th local threshold that was 20 or 40 copies per milliliter. So they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to, to either receive the same combination, but in a single tablet regimen necessarily, if it was not the case before, or to discontinue a Bacavir on 3TC and continue with dolutegravir alone, 15 milligram QD over a 48 week period. But the primary endpoint was at week 24. It was a proportion of patients with undetectable viremia, an intention to treat and pair protocol and analysis with pre planned non inferiority margin of 12%. Virological failure was defined as two consecutive plasma viral load above 50 copies. We looked also at secondary endpoints, the changes in CD4 count, ratio, renal function, lipids, and we conducted two uh, sub-studies uh, aiming at uh, looking at uh, HIV DNA and genital shedding in uh, uh, subpopulations. So here are the baseline characteristics of the patients. So you can see they are well balanced between the two groups. I just want to mention the long duration patients were on treatment before entering uh, Monkey. Some of them have been exposed to Altegravir or Alvitegravir. And you take a look at the Nadir CD4, CD4 count and the presence of PCR signal at the screening that is a detectable but unquantifiable plasma viral load. They are important for the next slides. Here are the primary outcomes at week 24. As you can see, the both treatment arms uh, achieved similar a virologic success, whatever the uh, method of uh, analysis. And at this time, uh, Dolichakavi was not inferred to triple therapy at week 24 with respect to the snapshot in intention to treat, modified intention to treat, and per protocol analysis. Just to look at the virologic non responders, at this time, week 24, there was two patients in the Dolichakavi arm that failed. They had the low-level viremia, no integrase in mutation, and were immediately resuppressed after treatment intensification. In the triple arm, one patient discontinued his treatment due to non-serious drug-related adverse effect. In fact, the problems came after the week 24, as you can see in this Kaplan-Meier curve showing uh, the viral-free survival patients over time. Uh, during the extended follow-up of the study, there was an increasing uh, number of patients with who failed with dolutegravir monotherapy while, while there was no patient in the triple arm, and it reached the significant, uh, significant uh, p-value. 
That is why a DSMB held at the end of 2017, and that the sponsor decided to stop the monotherapy arm according to DSMB recommendations. All patients who had not completed the week 48 visits, there was eight patients in that case, in that case were re intensified in immediately. Here is the summary of what we found in patients failing with dolutegravir monotherapy. As you can see, the, the week the failure occurred, the nadir CD4, the treatment, the duration on treatment before dolutegravir monotherapy. As you can see, here is the self-reported adhere, self adherence at week four, but also at week 24 was pretty high in those patients. The two last columns uh, concerned the peak varemia at failure. And we were successful in uh, amplifying uh, all patient, all viruses we found at failure, and only two patients had uh, mutations encoding for the resistance to the class. One patient had 147G uh, uh, plus uh, 155H mutation, and the other had a 263K mutation. And these were likely more uh, emerging mutations as we find a wild-type virus at the baseline in the DNA. When we looked at factors that were, that were associated with our virologic failure in dolutegravir arm, uh, in fact, we found three uh, different markers. Uh, patients who failed were more likely to have a low CD4 count, a low CD4 uh, nadir, and a PCR signal that is detectable but non-quantifiable plasma viral load at the screening. In multivariate analysis, two variables remained independently predictors of viral failure. A low CD4 count at screening with, was associated with an odd ratio of 1.7 per 100 cells decrease, and the presence of a signal at screening versus no signal that was associated with an 8.2 odd ratio of increased risk of uh, failure. Here are the safety issue at week uh, 48. As you can see, adverse effect and serious adverse effect related to steady medication or leading to trial discontinuation were well balanced between the two groups, even if uh, the total number of serious adverse effect was slightly more important in the triple therapy arm. It reached a significant p-value. Secondary endpoints from baseline to week 48. Uh, we did not uh, had significant changes uh, between arms uh, as concerned CD4 count, CD4 over CD8 ratio, EGFR, lipids and diffraction, uh, neither in uh, HIV DNA level. In the sub-study, we conducted in 32 patients from both arms. So the notable points of this study that no viral failure occurred in the triple arm, where we had seven occurred in the, in the dolichogavir arm with emerging resistance mutations in two patients. Uh, due to the design, uh, the comparator of dolichogavir monotherapy, monotherapy was pretty bit, uh, hard to beat. As for the demonos, uh, trial, we found that monotherapy was not inferred to triple therapy at week 24, but ap after that point, it led to a low but unacceptable viral failure incidence thereafter. As compared with boosted PI monotherapy, a residual varemia and the lower CD4 count or nadir was associated with a, an increasing risk of viral failure, perhaps suggesting that suboptimal immunovirologic control favored. Uh, uh, viral failure during uh, monotherapy. So to conclude, dolichogravir monotherapy was not inferred to triple therapy, but at only at week 24 and not beyond, and with a substantial risk of emerging mutations in case of failure, a, a feature that is not seen with boosted mo PI monotherapy. So our results, together with previous reports, clearly confirm that dolichogravir monotherapy is not uh, safe enough to uh, be a maintenance strategy in any kind of patients, even if perhaps there is, there is a, a special population that may be uh, interested uh, with dolichogravir monotherapy, perhaps those who have a high CD4 count and an optimal virology control uh, may be uh, beneficial uh, with dolichogravir monotherapy. I would like to finish my presentation by uh, uh, acknowledgements to the, those who made this study possible. Uh, my hospital was a sponsor and founder uh, with the help of Corévy uh, Centre Poitou-Charentes, the Monka team, 
the DSMB, and I really would like to thank warmly all patients who participated, gave time, and took personal risk to help us moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, microphone one. Hi, Laura Waters from London. I'm glad you mentioned personal risk. My first question is, I'm not clear of the timelines of your study. Did the DeMono results emerge during your study? And if they did, were your patients or participants reconsented based on that new information? Uh, we started the study in, uh, in the end of 2015. So we had the, the, the results of uh, the DeMono study. So yeah. that was discussed as part of the informed Yes, consent. individually with any patient. And my, my, second, not, not, my second point is, yeah. I find it astonishing that you refer to the two virological failures developing resistance as only two patients. That was 40% of your virological failures developed integrase mutations. So I'm interested to know what happened to those two individuals. Did they resuppress? So can you repeat that? Then? So you describe the virological failures and the resistance emergence as only two people developed resistance. Yes. That was 40% of the virological failures in your table, if I recall correctly. No? At the time of tw the week 24, there was no emerging mutations. No, no, Two I'm patients about the experienced. Five subsequent failures. That's five failures in the table, two with resistance. No? Am I looking at something different? Okay. Seven patients, that's two not at only, week 24 that's a and high, five after. That's a high, in my opinion, that's a high proportion of your failures developing resistance to the integrase class. I don't think that's only, and I would like to know what happened to those two individuals who developed integrase resistance on what we now know uh, as the optimal strategy. They, they were they? resuppressed uh, with a triple therapy. Thank you. Uh, Christine Gatlama, Paris. Um, thank you, Laura. If we try to reconcile and see what is the monodolitigravir st status, two questions. You mentioned that uh, a fairly high percentage of your patients were exposed to integrase inhibitor prior to monkey. Yeah. So were the failing patient among those who had been exposed? No, not at all. Okay, first point. And as it was said, mentioned by our Dutch colleague, as we already showed in the mono PI, that everybody said is not working, two key points. First, DNA at baseline. So was a difference between your failing and one with no failing, and also the duration of viral suppression. I'm not meaning the duration of art, because you may have been replicated for 10 years. So duration of virus suppression that we show, we and others, in the past that there was the best predictors for success of mono, at this time it was mono PI, and it has been uh, mentioned by, with mono So yes, what this, is no, We the have the no results? signal for that, but we are looking more accurately for that. Um, with the total duration before. There is no signal but, for that. So you have the total duration of viral suppression? Not for all the, the, the patients who, who didn't fail. So we are currently uh, doing and that. I cannot believe that you don't have the DNA. At this was not captured by the oh. electronic uh, observation. Microphone four. Yeah, hi, it's Joey Ron from Chapel Hill. I just would like to make the point that um, for non-inferiority studies for people who are suppressed for three years or 9.4 years, uh, uh, inferiority margin of 10% or 12% really is unacceptable. Um, those people Today, should yeah, stay okay. suppressed and, and it should be much, right. much lower. Um, and, and doing these small studies where there's a chance that you might not observe what you did observe should really, we should think carefully about I that. I totally agree with you, but uh, it was not the standard of care at this time when we planned to do the, the trial. But I totally agree with you. Okay, microphone two. 
Sorry. Too, yeah, sorry. <coughs> sorry, Simon Collins from iBase again. Um, so I like the fact your DSMB stopped the study. Um, I like the fact that you emphasise that the unpredictability of unpredictability of viral rebound comes with long term can come with long term follow up. And my concern for these patients uh, and in the previous study is is that viral load monitoring is getting reduced when you're on constant therapy, and it's not just the implications that you get cross class resistance if viral load rebounds, but you put the the potential partners of these people at risk as well. Because if your viral load monitoring is reduced, you, know, you can't monitor people for four years in a study. So I liked your conclusions that your DSNB closed the monotherapy arm. Why? <coughs> I like the fact that your DSNB closed... And you like the fact. I do. And I like the fact that you emphasised the unpredictability of viral rebound when it does occur, because by definition it's unpredictable. And, and, and some people, if they continue using this therapy, will lose the class resistance and they, they put their partners at risk. So not okay. your, your, your study is good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, now. There was another, the last yes. question, yeah. microphone one, okay. please. Uh, congratulations, Laurent. Uh, congratulations for your study. You, Did you me. look at adherence in the monotherapy arm? And don't you think that the people with residual viremia at the beginning were possibly less adherent? What do you think? For, uh, we, we did, actually, currently, we, are, we have not the comparison between those who failed and those who didn't fail. But for those who failed, we look uh, accurately at uh, uh, many uh, ways to uh, uh, look at the adherence rate. There was a questionnaire during the study at week 4, 24, and at the last visit, and we didn't have uh, significant... This is was, this was self-reported adherence rate. There was nothing to do with that. Uh, we also looked at uh, pharmacy refill, and we didn't see anything uh, uh, in that way, but uh, perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps it explained the, the, the biological failure. In a cohort study, we have found these uh, results. Patient with a, low, a high adherence, but uh, a lower than those who, who didn't fail uh, were a failure. OK, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, the next presentation is a phase 3B open label pilot study to evaluate switching to Elvitegravir, Covicistat, Emtricitabine, and TAF in virologically suppressed HIV-1 infected adult subjects, harboring with NR NARTI-resistant mutation M184V or I. This is presented by Ignacio Pérez Valero. Ignacio holds an MD and PhD from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. He is consultant physician of internal medicine at Hospital Universitario de La Paz and senior clinical researcher at EDIPAS Research Institute in Madrid. He presented more than 250 communications, published more than 50 indexes paper and several books, his areas of interest include antiretroviral neurotoxicity, neurocognitive outcomes, and antiretroviral strategies. Thank you, Ignacio. Hello, good morning. Thank you for your kind presentation. Uh, I would like to present uh, this study on behalf of my co-authors. These are my, my disclosures. And as all you know, a single target antiretroviral regimen for switch has demonstrated to improve adherence, re reduce pill burden, and el eliminated risk of partial non-adherence. But sometimes the use of STR regimens are limited by the presence of resistant mutations such as the M184B or I mutation. This mutation, as you know, is the most common NRTI mutation in patients treated with 3TC and FTC and occurs in up to 64% of treated patients with prior biological failure. These mutations confer resistance to FTC and 3TC and decreases susceptibility to abacavir, but increases susceptibility to tenofovir. N184 mutations may not preclude respond to ECF-TDF or ECF-TAF, and especially to ECF-TAF because TAF with fourfold higher intracellular tenofovir diphosphate than TDF may have additional activity against viruses with resistant mutation, including N184B or I mutation. 
To test this hypothesis, we develop an ongoing multicenter international open label single arm study in HIV infected adults with HIV RNA below 50 copies per ml receiving FTC, TDF, or Abacavir 3TC plus a third agent. The study was designed in two parts. In the first part, we recruited patients harboring an isolated M184B or I mutation that switched to ECF TAF and were followed up to 48 weeks. Uh, this, uh, this part, uh, the recruitment was halted at 37 patients on this part due to problems to find uh, patients that fulfill the selection criteria defined in the study. And the second part that is already enrolling included patients with the M184B or I mutation and up to two times, and the design was exactly the same. The primary point of our study at 12 weeks was uh, the HIV RNA below 50 copies per ml using pure virological response. Primary objective of our study was to evaluate the efficacy of switching to ECF TAF in maintaining HIV RNA below 50 copies per ml at week 12 in participants with N184B or I mutation using pure virological response. Secondary objectives were to determine the safety and tolerability of ECF TAF in participants switching from two NRTIs plus a third agent. To evaluate the emergence of new resistant mutation in participants who develop virological failure after switching to ECF TAF, and to determine the durability at weeks 24 and 48 in maintaining HIV RNA below 50 copies using pure virological response. For those of you who are not familiarized with the definition of pure virological response, uh, we consider that a patient is a success in pure virological response in absence of confirmed virological failure before week 12 or week 24, and in absence of premature discontinuation with, with last available HIV RNA equal or above 50 copies per ml. ECF TAF discontinuations prior to week 12 or to week 24 for reasons other than biological rebound are considered to have pure biological response. <coughs> Key inclusion criteria of our study were to have an HIV RNA below 50 copies per ml at the screening and for at least six months, one blip was permitted during this period. Currently receiving FTC TDF or Abacavir 3TC plus a third agent for at least six months. A lower uh, third agents include NNRTIs, PI, Rotegravir, or Dolutegravir. To have a M184B and or M184I mutation on historical genotype, the absence of exclusionary PI, NRTI, or ENSTI mutation on historical genotype, no additional exclusionary mutations seen on provided DNA genotype done at the screening on all participants, no prior biological failure on PI or uh, INSTI-based regimens, and an estimated GFR above or equal to 30 milliliters per minute using Cockroft Gold formula. This is the subject disposition of the study. 34 patients were screened, 38 enrolled, and 37 were treated. Three patients discontinued before week 12, one due to an adverse event, another uh, at investigation discretion, and another due to a protocol violation. These three patients uh, were undetectable at the moment of discontinuation and were considered a success using pure virological response analysis. 34 patients completed week, week 12 and week th uh, 24 of the study. These are the baseline characteristics of our sample. As you can see, the median age was 51. Most of our patients were Caucasian male with a good immunological status and a good uh, renal function. Uh, prior regimens, uh, the backbone of prior regimens, uh, half of them was uh, FTC TDF, around half of them, and around half of the previous regimens received a, a PI-based regimen. Regarding baseline resistance, on historical genotypes, all participants had an M184B or I mutation, and approximately half of the participants also have an NRTI resistance mutations. On provided DNA performed at screening, M184B and I mutation were detected only in less than half of the participants. Provided DNA resistant testing failed to detect known N184B or I mutation and NNRTI resistance seen on historical genotype.
on our study. This is mo the most important uh, results of the study, the, the efficacy results, and as you can see, using pure biological response, the 100% of the uh, patients included in our study fulfilled uh, the criteria of success, and we didn't find any patients uh, who had an HIV RNA above 50 copies per ml. Two, only two participants during the follow-up experienced a single blip, and we didn't find, as I mentioned, virological failure or emergence of new resistance during the trial. Regarding safety, adverse events uh, related with the study drug where uh, uh, the proportion was uh, 22%. Uh, none of them were grade three or four, and only one patient discontinued due to an adverse event that was muscle spasm. Regarding serious adverse events, we found four patients that had a serious adverse event. None, none of them were drug-related but by the study investigators. Two of them were carcinomas, and the other two were uh, uh, an episode of proteinuria, an acute kidney injury, and renal failure in patients uh, harboring uh, pre-existing uh, renal comorbidities. In conclusion, in this open-label study of participants with HIV RNA below 50 copies per ml harboring the M184B and or M184I mutation switching to ECFTAF, uh, maintain virological suppression in 1% of the patient using the week 12 and week 24 peer virological response analysis. The regimen was well tolerated with no SAE or grade three or four adverse events that were study drug related and one discontinuation due to adverse events. Compared to historical genotypes, proviral DNA resistant testing only detected N184B or I and NNRTI resistance in approximately half of the participants. And switching to ECFTAF may be considered for, for patients with pre-existing N184B and or N184I mutations. And part two of the study with N184B and I mutation and up to two times is currently enrolled. I would like to, to thank all the participants in the trial, their partners and families, and all, and all uh, participant study investigators. Thank you very much for your attention. Mike, to Rafi. François Rafi from uh, Nantes, France. Uh, Ignacio, could you clarify uh, on the mutation the patient harbored uh, when they were enrolled? You say they had 184V or I, and when you presented the results, it was 184V slash I. Uh, when you have only 184I, it could be in suppressed patients a marker of defective virus in the cells, so it doesn't imply that the patients had prior uh, failure, and in the inclusion criteria, prior failure was not uh, required. So uh, do you know how many patients had only 184i? At, it might not be the same story at, as when you have 184v or v slash i. The, uh, I don't have uh, that uh, specific data, I'm sorry. But the patient could fail, but only on an, an NRTI-based regimen, no on a PI or an integration They inhibitor. could fail, but they no, they no it was not mandatory, yes. But theoretically, to, the, to develop a 184 mutation, you need a failure. Not for 184. Oh, okay. And therefore? Can you, can you tell me a little bit about the 36 screen failures? Uh, was it because you found resistance in the DNA that they were screen failures or? Sorry, which? which? The screen, the screen failures. Ah, the screen failures. More of them were, uh, more than half of them were related with uh, problems to, to find uh, an isolated 184B mutation. More of, mo most of them ha uh, have also uh, another TAMS uh, at uh, a provider DNA performance at the screening. So that was the, mo the, the main reason for screening failures. Ignacio, uh, the, the criteria for having a, a non-failing PI before is for protecting the, the rescue salvage regimen, or what is the rationale for that? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, 
probably to, to, to have a an, an second treatment. You know? It's be, because this is a proof of concept trial yeah. and uh, uh, we, we try to, to protect the patients against a potential developing of, a, of an other mutation that could compromise the regimen that we were not able to, de to determine during the provider DNA uh, testing. And the, and the shorter one. What you seen that you have only in the DNA only 50% of uh, one eighty four instead of I mean you have one hundred percent in the historical. Yes. Well, the, both both tests were performed at different uh, time points, so it, it could be possible that the test was not uh, en enough uh, have not enough potency to detect the mutation, or that the mutation was erased uh, during the follow up. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. The next presentation is a non-inferior efficacy of dolutegravir plus 3TC versus dolutegravir plus tenofovir and tricitabine fixed dose combination in antiretroviral treatment in adults with HIV-1 infections. 48 weeks result from the Gemini studies. And for me, it really is a very uh, great honor and a pleasure to introduce my mentor in this presentation, Pedro Can. Pedro, uh, MD, PhD, is a, the scientific director of Fundación Huesped. Uh, this is the largest NGO devoted to HIV in Argentina. He serves also as a senior consultant physician at the Hospital Juan Fernández. He is professor of infectious disease at the University of Buenos Aires and is author of more than 200 peer-reviewed papers, books, and chapters. He is presented the Gemini study as principal investigator on behalf of the Gemini study teams. Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you, Mark. Good morning. I would, I would like to thank the organizers for selecting our paper to be presented at this important conference. I don't have the dis uh, disclosure slides, but I will tell you orally that I am a member of uh, Advanced Awards for Merck and for Beef Healthcare, and I gave lectures for those companies and, uh, and also for Abby. Uh, why are we doing this study? The, w w what is the background? Well, as you know, uh, as of today, antiretroviral therapy means lifelong treatment. So uh, as much as we can do in order to reduce drug burden for our patients would be very welcome. In terms of less long-term drug toxicity, and, and for that, we need to select the appropriate regimes. Because as you know, some uh, dual therapy trials have failed uh, in, in the latest years. <coughs> So we selected dolutegravir because dolutegravir has the potency, the safety, and the, and the higher resistant barrier as an optimal core agent for this regimen. And as we learned from other trials, we need to suppress the nucleoside reverse transcriptase uh, enzyme in, in order to um, make it uh, work. And 3TC fits perfectly for, for that because of its safety, tolerability, lack of drug-drug interactions, and the, the issue that is also important for many of us, that is now a generic drug, and, uh, and as such, it, it should be cheap. Previous studies have evaluated this strategy. We did the pattern study and showed uh, a 90% efficacy at 48 weeks, and afterwards at, at 96 weeks. And the ACTG 5353 had the primary endpoint at week 24, and showed exactly the same results, 90% efficacy. So wh what we did was to um, generate two uh, sister trials, Gemini 1 and Gemini 2, phase 3 trials, identically designed, randomized, double-blind, parallel group, multicentric, non-inferiority studies. To be enrolled in the study, you need to be HIV infected, but naive, having a viral load between 1,000 copies and 500,000, uh, not previously, uh, not pre previous exposure except for some cases of post-exposure prophylaxis, no evidence of pre-existing viral resistance based on the, pres on the presence of any major resistant associated mutations, and importantly, no hepatitis B infection or immediate need in the, uh, uh, for uh, hepatitis C therapy. The primary endpoint of, of this week uh, of this uh, study was at week 48. Proportion of patients with less than 50 copies in the intention to treat FDA snapshot analysis. Several countries participated in the study, and a long list of investigators will be shown at the end of the presentation. Uh, of note, baseline stratification factors that, that we used 
where plasma viral load above and below 100,000 copies, and also CD4 cell counts above and below 200 CD4s. Here are the basic characteristics and randomization took care to, to give us a, a very balanced population, 716 patients in the dual therapy arm and 717 in the triple therapy arm with a mean age uh, around the 30th with 15% uh, of female participating, about uh, 12 to 14% African-American heritage, 30% Hispanic or Latino. And the two surrogate markers that we always look at you can see here 20% of the population had more than 100,000 100, copies and a, low, uh, a lower number, less than 10%, had less than 200 CD4, probably re reflecting the, the current trend of uh, treating uh, everybody uh, uh, without regard to the uh, CD4 count. Here you see the results for Gemini 1. As I told you, we have two Gemini studies. And uh, Gemini 1 showed 90% efficacy for the dual therapy and 93% for, for, for the triple therapy. And you, you can see that the lower uh, bound of the confidence interval is, is far from being uh, close to minus 10. And uh, virological non-response and non-virological data were very similar. Here we go with uh, Gemini 2, 93 and 94% efficacy. So we can claim non-inferiority for the dolotegravir uh, 3TC combination when compared to dolotegravir plus tenofovir FTC in the snapshot intention to treat analysis for both studies. Uh, let me show you from now on the uh, snapshot analysis by, by both studies pulled uh, as it were one study. And as you can see, uh, as, as we see with all the integrase inhibitors, a rapid decline in viral load was observed from week four onwards. And from week 12 to 16 onwards, we, we, we achieved the 90% the, the range uh, uh, that were the final results up to week 48. Let me clarify for you that in terms of establish the durability of this strategy, the, the patients will be followed in a double blind manner until week 144. Uh, regarding CD4 gains, very similar, 224 for dolotegravir 3TC, 218 for dolotegravir plus 2 nukes. And these are the pool snapshot outcomes. Uh, I showed you already the virological success in the intention to treat. And here you see the per protocol analysis, 93% for the dual therapy arm, 94% for the uh, <clears throat> triple therapy arm. As, and as you can see, in both analysis, intention to treat and per protocol, uh, non-inferiority was confirmed. Now let's go to the, uh, to the uh, strata. Uh, here, here you see the, the, the strata uh, with less than 100,000 copies and with more than 100,000 copies. And in both cases, uh, really the, the, the results are, are very similar. When we go to the, to the results of uh, C, CD4, you can see that in the strata with more than 200 CD4, the numbers are exactly the same. Nevertheless, we see a delta in the less than 200 CD4s. But if you, if you look at the, at the uh, uh, treatment-related discontinuation equals failure analysis, in which you only uh, con uh, consider the failures that are related to uh, lack of virological response or discontinuation due to adverse events related to the study drug, you will see that this, the, this difference shrinks. If uh, the, there, is a, there is a list of the cert certain patients that failed in the... Uh, in the uh, less than 200 CD4 strata, and th this includes patients with Chaga disease, tuberculosis, withdrawal of, of consent, etc. When we go to the, uh, uh, to the uh, confirmed biological withdrawals, as you can see, four cases in Gemini 1 for the dual therapy, two in, uh, for the triple therapy in Gemini 2, 2 and 2. So pulled, it makes six cases of biological failure in the dual therapy arm and four cases in the triple therapy arm. And I think one of the most important messages from, from this study is that no treatment emergent resistance, neither for the integrase inhibitors nor for the nucleosides, were observed among participants who met confirmed virological uh, failure criteria. Uh, regarding adverse events, nothing special is popping up. We, 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 we saw a little bit less uh, adverse events in the dolotegravir 3 dc arm, 76% compared to 81%. Most frequent adverse events reported in at least 5% of participants were headache, diarrhea, and nasopharyngitis. Drug-related adverse events, 18% in the, in the dolotegravir 3 dc arm, 24% in the triple therapy arm, and the, the, the most frequent adverse event that was considered related to, to drugs with headache, so... Uh, doesn't doesn't bring any any relevant information, in my view. 
Uh, regarding neuropsychiatric adverse events, less than 1% in each group, and any serious adverse events, no difference, 7% versus 8%. 8%. I don't pretend that you read all this, and, uh, and also don't, I don't pretend that you memorize it. It's just to show it that, uh, that uh, adverse events leading to withdrawal, in, in, in no case, as you can see in both columns, were more than two. So really, the, the, uh, the importance of any of, of these events is negligible in, in the context of uh, more than 1,400 people participating in the trial. We saw some difference in renal, renal biomarkers. And G, GFR from cystatin C increased in both arms, but increased more in the dolotegravir 3 tc arm. The same happens to be true with, uh, with creatinine in the opposite. Creatinine uh, elevation was lower in the dual therapy arm, and GFR calculated from uh, creatinine uh, was, uh, the, the, the decrease was higher in the triple therapy arm. And if you look at the urine markers, you, you will see exactly the same pattern. When it comes to bone markers, uh, we, we tested here four different bone markers, and as you can see, uh, be it alkaline phosphatase, serum osteocalcin, procollagen 1, or C telopeptide, uh, in, in all cases, the, the difference reached uh, statistical significance in favor of dual therapy. So in conclusion, Gemini 1 and 2 results demonstrate <coughs> non-inferior <coughs> sorry, non-inferior biological efficacy for the two drug regimen compared to the triple drug regimen at week 48. Both arms were associated with low rates of confirmed biological withdrawals through week 48. No treatment emerging resistant, neither for in integrase inhibitors or for nucleoside, were observed among participants who met confirmed biological withdrawal criteria. The overall safety and tolerability was comparable between the two regimes with a little, view, a little bit of fewer drug-related adverse events in dual therapy. Change in renal and bone markers significantly favors dolotegravir and 3TC. And we think that this data support dolotegravir 3TC as an effective option for the treatment of HIV infection. And let me finish by acknowledging the large list of investigators that participated in different countries and a special recognition to the people living with HIV who have generously participated in the Gemini trial. Thank you for your attention. Micro. Mikey, in number one. Uh, Andrew Hill from Liverpool University. These are really impressive results, but the inclusion criteria involve diagnostic tests with high viral load, uh, drug resistance, hepatitis B co-infection. And I'd suggest that in most countries with large HIV epidemics, these tests are not available. What do you think about the use of this, of this dual combination treatment in countries in sub-Saharan Africa where the, the, you simply can't do these, or these tests are not available? Thank you, Andrew. <coughs> Andrew, you are completely right. We shouldn't extrapolate the results of this particular clinical trial to, to say everybody can use this, this strategy. We need to find out probably with, with other studies if this could be applicable or not. So, so far, I would say don't do, don't do this at home if you don't have the conditions that we had in the, in the uh, design of the trial. Thank you, Pedro, for this very nice presentation. I was wondering whether you had pregnancy during this trial and how did you deal with the recent announcement of the DTG teratogenicity signal? Well, when the, when the trial was finished, I mean finished in, the, in terms of the 48 weeks, uh, we, um, we didn't know uh, about the, the, the recent announcement of the CEPAMO cohort. Pregnancy was, a, 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 was an, an exclusion criteria and was also a criteria for stopping the trial. And uh, so far, uh, I, what I know is that we, we had a couple of pregnancies in our, in our group, and they, they developed, uh, they, they, they were out of the study, and the babies were born without any, any problem. Doesn't mean that this, this is the truth, but that, that's what happened to us, only two cases. Uh, Pedro, François. François. Uh, could, could, what, what was the rationale to define Varagic rebound above 200 copies? two consecutive about 200 copies, rather than two consecutive are not about 50 copies? The, uh, if, I, if I got correctly your, your question, the confirmed virological rebound was to have uh, more than 50 copies confirmed with a second viral load above 200. That was the, the, the confirmed virological rebound criteria. Well, this was different on the slide. No. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, and you're right, as usual. 
Next. Uh, Next. Next. Oh, uh -huh. No, on the resistance slide. Sorry? On the resistance slide. Uh, on the resistance slide, okay. Let me go there. Well, Varogic rebound was defined as consum rebound above 200 copies. If either a decrease in plasma or, or, or less than one log by, by week 12, with, with, with no, last line, I mean. Last line. Why okay. was it 200 copies, not 50 copies? He's supposed to be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, biological rebound, you are, you are right, is confirmed. It's defined as confirmed rebound in plasma HIV RNA levels to more than 200 uh, cells after prior confirmed suppression to, to 200. Yes, that's right. You will see that in, the, in some patients that were in the, in the window, they had more than 50, but less than 200. They, they, they continue in the study, and, and, and some of them really suppressed. So that, I, I don't think if this, I don't know if this answers your, your, your question. I have a question, if you don't. Uh, number. I, I miss if you, if you comment something uh, related with the proportion of bleeps in both treatment arms. Did you analyze that or not? I don't have the information. I, I'm sure the information is in the database. Uh, you have to forgive me because uh, the, the, the data came out of, of the oven just uh, last week, so it's brand new and we are still analyzing a lot of, uh, a lot of information that is pending. Number one. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Khan. Great presentation. Uh, Jeff Berry, Positively Wear Magazine. I was wondering, for patients on dolutegravir, real pivorine, if, there, if you have any feelings about, um, or if you know of any studies planned, or if there's any data you could extrapolate in switching from those regimens, from dolutegravir, uh, real pivorine to uh, DTG, 3TC. Well, first of all, this, this was not a switch study. Oh, I, this, this oh, I study, understand that, yes. This, this was a study in naive patients. They are ongoing studies uh, uh, testing the, the strategy of the Lutegravir 3 tc as a switch option, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, to answer your, your question until we see the, those results. Thank you. A short question, the last one, please. Hi, my name is Heather Berner from Medscape Medical News. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just, and I apologize if I missed this, but um, I didn't see, was, were there any sex differences between the outcomes of virological suppression? I, I'm sorry, I missed your question. Could, could you speak were up? Were there any sex differences? Were, oh. Was viral suppression different between men, women and men? Well, the, the uh, subgroup analysis uh, is, being imp is being done as we speak, and we, we hope to present in a future conference the subgroup ana analysis by gender, by uh, country, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but we don't have the data yet. Sorry, Christine, we are out of the time. We are passing. Ah. Thank you very much. Uh, So it's now time to go to the last presentation from uh, François Venter. François Venter is the Deputy Executive Director of the Witt Reproductive Health and HIV Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. He leads multiple antiretroviral treatment optimization studies, and he has an active interest in public sector access to HIV services. He is currently working on innovative first and also second line treatment, patient linkage to care interventions, and HIV self-testing project. And he will present us today a late breaker on the non-inferiority efficacy of low dose darinavir boosted by ritonavir once daily versus lopinavir ritonavir. It's a 48 weeks results. So Francois, the floor is to you. Wonderful, and thank you. Um, so this study is to demonstrate the non-inferiority of 400 milligrams um, of darinavir combined with ritonavir. I think it's quite important to look at the history of the study. It arose several years ago when we were thinking of, um, about having an NRTI-based first-line therapy in a single tablet and then a second-line, single-line therapy. In, um, uh, in, and what was being thought about was could we combine low-dose Dorinavir with Dolutegravir, so a kind of blue tablet, red tablet strategy for first and second line. And that initiative was actually led by the Bill, um, and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Chris Duncombe. And obviously, the world's moved on, and we're looking at integrase inhibitor areas, but it's important to understand why 
the dosing and, and the kind of study we were looking at. And this study was to sort of bulletproof future studies looking at that, um, that red tablet combination. Um, it's part of an optimization group which involves everyone from public health people to donors to manufacturers to, to, to activists um, and has evolved into this group called Optimize with several um, um, studies looking at improving and optimizing therapies in resource limited settings. Um, so the approved dose of Darinavir 100 is 800-100 for PI naive patients. Um, and Darinavir is the most popular choice in most international guidelines um, against uh, the conventional ones. The, the major reason we haven't had access to Darinavir, certainly in my setting, is the, the cost of Darinavir is often sev several times greater than that of um, Lopinavir or Atazanavir, as well as the fact that you can't, um, Lopinavir we've traditionally gone to is the drug that we can double dose in the context of TB, which is still common. Um, we have results from several pilot studies and PKPD analyses suggesting that 400, 100, um, once daily shows equivalent efficacy to the standard dose. Um, Darinavir has quite complex pharmacokinetics. Um, and we designed this, page, this study to evaluate the efficacy and safety of the 400, 100 milligram dose as a switch option. So in terms of background, if you look at some of the registration studies, you can see that in the power um, study, for instance, that if your um, fold change increases more than four, the higher the dose you went, um, the, more you, you, the more likely you were to, to get suppression. However, if you went backwards and you looked at these patients who had baseline didn't have, um, didn't have resistance, didn't have a, that fourfold fold change, um, you could see that the actually low dose, the 400-100 dose, which was looked at during the registration processes, actually worked very well. So PI-naive patients theoretically would do very well in 400-100 milligrams. So this was the study design. It's important. This is a switch study. We're not looking at patients failing first-line therapy, which is a very different population. We took patients who were virologically suppressed um, and happy on their lopinavir, ritonavir. They'd been on the treatment for more than six months. Um, and we had confirmation that their viral load was below 50 in the last 60 days. We did do a baseline viral load. Um, we took 300 of those. We either left them on their nuke backbone and their lopinavir, or we switched their... Um, them to the low dose darinavir and, and retain their new backbone. And then the rest of the follow up is over 48, is fairly, um, 48 weeks is fairly conventional. The primary efficacy endpoints um, were using the FDA snapshot mechanism. Um, and Joe alluded to the fact that the FDA issued guidance which altered the, 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 the non inferiority margin from, um, from 12 to, to 4 percent. And um, from 4 to 12, uh, 12 to 4 percent, and we that that actually got issued as the study was finishing recruiting, and our statisticians, both on the DSMB and within our study team under Andy Hill, had discussions about what to do with that. So this is what happened, which is almost nothing. Um, on the Darunavir arm, as you can see, we had four patients withdraw. Um, we had um, one death from a myocardial infarction. Um, two adverse events um, which, were, which led to that, and um, otherwise, as I said, very little actually happened within, within the study. Um, this is the background demographics. You can see very similar, um, as is the case in our, our treatment programs, predominantly female. Um, these patients had been on treatment for a while. They had good immune reconstitution, and um, you can see that, in general, they were fit and healthy. This, um, I hope it projects out there, it does, it does actually, um, you can see that very, very little happened virologically. There were little blips, most of them quite low, below 1,000 copies, um, throughout the course of the studies. Um, and as I said, the patients maintained virological control in both arms. And if we use the, um, on the left, the, the FDA snapshot um, analysis and then um, the ITT analysis on the right, you can see there was almost no difference between the two arms, um, confirming that this was uh, a useful um, drug in terms of a non-inferiority option. The, again, as you'd expect, we had, as very similar to other similar sort of protease inhibitor studies, um, the, pati the patients where we were able to amplify, which was only a handful in each arm, um, tended to, they didn't have any PI mutations and they had a smattering of NRTI resistance mutations um, in, both, in both arms, but very, very few. This is probably the most important slide, I think, in terms of uh, in terms of what you should be looking at, because you, I think, as we all know, the ethics of these switch studies are important, and we are about to do this with the Favrins to Dolotegavir, is when you've got somebody stable and happy on the therapy, moving them to another therapy is going to be associated with changes. Um, 
and even if you go down, you look at the drug-related adverse events, it looks very horrifying with 30 to 8. Most of those are actually laboratory-based um, adverse events, not, um, um, not, uh, not clinical events. We did have three, uh, um, two patients who withdrew from the Durinavir arm, both for hepatitis, um, and all three of the drug-related serious adverse events were actually hepatitis cases in the Durinavir arm. Um, very, again, very, very little happened within the, the biochemistry, and there was no real change between any of the other things, such as glucose. Um, so there was no real laboratory-based benefit from moving to the Durinavir arm. So in this study, we, should, we demonstrated the non-inferior efficacy to, uh, uh, using 400-100 as a switch option in, um, in patients um, who, were, who were suppressed. Um, it's consistent with other pilot studies of both 600 and 400 milligrams of Durinavir, and um, a lower dose would be um, significantly cheaper. We, we've had some work with the Clinton Health Access people who've demonstrated, who've suggested that low dose Durinavir at this dose at scale is probably going to be cheaper than Lopinavir or Atazanavir, which makes certainly in the setting of resource poor countries um, an appealing option. And we would, this cannot be extrapolated. We would need an earnest type study looking at 400, 100 in patients failing first line, which is becoming very complex to do in the Dolitegra era. So I'd like to thank the South African Medical Research Council. It's the first large clinical study that they funded, and USID, who also funded the study, the South African Department of Health, the Optimized Consortium, and everybody in it, including the Scientific Advisory Council, Andrew Hill and his colleagues, um, for, doing, for helping a great deal, my long-suffering staff, and the Clinton Health Access people for trying to get us the drugs across the border. Um, and this demonstrates the nationality of the people who participated in Johannesburg. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I take advantage of being the chair to ask you one question. I do remember from a previous study presented by Jean-Michel Molina showing there was no difference in PK data on patients with 400 versus 800 darinavir boosted by 100 milligram ritonavir. I was therefore wondering whether we could use a 50 milligram uh, ritonavir to boost darinavir that would also lower the dose and maybe also the exposure if we want to lower the side effects. What Whenever do you think? I talk to the PK, this is way above my pay grade. Whenever I talk about to the PK people, they all go pale whenever we suggest the 50 milligrams of ritonavir. So I think that seems to be, most of them seem to agree. One of the problems we have is we don't have a 400, 100, we have a 450 milligram tablet in, in development. So we would need, if we were going to take this dose strategy forward, we would need to ask you know, for this new, this new formulation to be made available. Only Janssen at the moment has it, not any of the generics. Uh, yeah, sorry, microphone three. Thank you very much, Fancho. Um, did you expect to see any metabolic benefits from reducing the Ritonavir dosage per day? I think it's a good question. I think what might have happened is that these patients were actually quite tightly monitored prior to them getting into the study. I think some of the patients might have been filtered out, the ones who were predisposed to developing diabetes or raised lipids on the study. So I don't think we can quite say that there would be no benefits. I, I, as I said, we didn't see any real difference between the, the lipids and the glucose. But on the face of it, these patients might have been screened out who would have derived the most benefit. We, there was no harm. Okay, so if there is no further questions, I think we will close the session on time. And thank you very much for all of you who had to uh, stay. Uh...